Hi there and welcome. I'm Robin Marie Smith and this is the Makers Tech U member spotlight series and I have a very special guest today, Jackie Holmgren. She is actually British but she lives in Sweden and has for quite a few years of her life and I'm really excited to have her here today. She has an amazing story from probably about the time you were the age of four. So I want to kind of go back all the way to that point. But Jackie is an artist. She um, actually got her education at St. Martin's in London. And she is an illustrator and an artist. And she just has so many um, facets to the art that she creates. So welcome, Jackie. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you. It's really exciting. <laughs> so let's start with your very beginning years. I think about the age of four, you actually were found painting with red lipstick on your grandmother's sofa. So that kind of started it, right? That's right. I, I mean, I, it, it's really weird what you remember. Uh, but I, I, I can just remember myself. It was a brown sofa, lots of texture on it. I was, I was hidden behind between some French windows and the sofa. And I had my grandmother's lipstick, which was a dark red. And I was like drawing and I suddenly I looked to the side and that's my mother standing there. And she, oh, she was hysterical. Oh. So yeah, and actually I still have, it sounds ridiculous because it's probably rotted now and rancid, but I still have that lipstick <laughs> in a little gold, you know, a really old fashioned 1950s gold uh, case. So oh yeah, my. not my best of it, but. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, at least you were painting on the backside of the sofa. That's right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Of course, you probably had much more room to like really get, you know. Your oh, it was a great canvas. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's fast forward to the um, the story about, I think it was a book called Heidi, which is also your your oldest daughter's name, where you That's were right. sketching or drawing the drawings that were in there and then you cut them out. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, um, my, uh, I'm a, in Swedish, they call it a slad barn. It means a, a child on a lead. So in other words, I had my brother and sister, and then 14 years later, I was born. So they had sort of got married and left home. And my mother, who was 37 when she had me, anything for a bit of peace, uh, she sort of let me, and all I wanted to do was draw. And I got this book for my sixth birthday. And I don't know, I just fell in love with, um, well, just the, the whole story and Switzerland. And in fact, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll move to Switzerland when I grow up, but it was Sweden. So, you know, not quite the same place, but um, she, I was allowed to draw pictures of Heidi and, and funnily enough, Peter the goat herd. I married a man called Peter, so it's very odd. Um, and then the goats. And then I, I had sort of nail scissors and cut them out. And I said, I want to glue them on the kitchen wall. And my mother sort of said, well, do it then. <laughs> you know? So I remember we had all my pictures glued on the kitchen wall. I mean, I, she was amazing. She was an amazing mother. So that was it. <laughs> it sounds like she really did encourage you. Um, and it obviously at an early age, it was obvious that you were going to want to do something creative. So, yeah. but you also yeah. had a little bit of business sense too, at the age of nine. So tell us about the, <laughs> um, the catalog that you put together. Oh yes. The, the catalog. Well, um, I had sort of like a, a large old, I suppose you call it a ledger that, that, you know, it just had lines in it and stuff. And I decided that I was going to do my own mail order catalog. So I, drew lots of things and then I went door to door <laughs> to the neighbours and I, I sort of put a price on things and then bless their hearts these these neighbours mostly women ordered things from me and so I came back and I was thrilled and went to my mother and said can you help me make this because you see I've sold it already and she was like you've what? So <laughs> So anyway, she had, she had to actually go to the neighbors. She actually helped me make one thing. And then she said, this is ridiculous. So she went to the neighbors and said, I'm really, really sorry. I, you know, don't worry. She, she won't be bothering you again. Oh my goodness. I love, I just love that story. I think that's amazing. <laughs> it, it shows not only your creativity, but your, your business sense. And okay, well, I'm going to just offer this to the neighbors then and make a business. <laughs> out of it. I just yes. love it. I think that's so amazing. So you definitely had um, a sense of that because I know once you left college and we'll go to that, that you actually started your own business. So, so tell me about that where you, um, I think you were eight, 19 when you went to college in London. So tell that's us. That's right. Yes. I, 
I knew that I wanted to do something artistic and uh, I did a, a year's foundation course at a, because my parents lived in the middle of England and I wanted to go to St Martin's because there was no I, there was no other school I wanted to go to I just wanted to go to St Martin's and so I did this year's foundation course where you could try all different kinds of art so it was everything from you know life drawing photography but I actually sort of got stuck in the textile department printing my own textiles mm -hmm. which I just loved and so I decided okay I'll start a, I'll study fashion and textiles at St Martin's and in those days I mean this was like the 70s mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of quite quite famous designers who'd been there in the 60s and that, and that kind of thing so it felt like a good thing to do anyway so I, um, I arrived at St Martin's and, uh, and I managed to get in, which was fantastic. But then I realized that um, I, I actually didn't like pattern cutting. and I didn't particularly like sewing, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you could choose a subsidiary subject. And I chose fashion drawing mm -hmm. and textile design. Uh, mostly printed textiles. There were you could choose different ones. There was uh, there was knitted textiles. There was like millinery. You could do hat making, all sorts of things. But anyway, th that's what I decided. So anyway, I got through the three years of college, and um, my sister and her husband had already moved to Sweden. He worked for a British company called Dunlop that made tires, and they'd lived all over the world. And then they were moved to Sweden just as I started at, at art school. So they were there for about three and a half years. And I went and visited them in the summer and just absolutely fell in love with Sweden. I, I didn't meet my husband or anything. I just, it was, there was something very special about Sweden. Um, and it was almost like going 50 years back uh, in time. I don't mean that they were old fashioned in that way because it's, it's a very modern country, mm -hmm. but um, the traditions are very, very important uh, to Swedes. And I noticed that sort of uh, at Easter time, you know, they, they change the curtains. There's lots of decorations for Easter, which we never really bothered with. It was just like chocolate eggs in England, you know, it wasn't that, you know, the old chicken and that kind of thing. But oh. here is a big thing. And Christmas was so lovely. And oh, there were so many different things. And um, I, I'd been in the fashion world for three years in London. And it was actually quite bitchy, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, and it, it didn't suit me at all. Mm. And so I decided uh, I'll just move to Sweden. So I, I literally just, just moved with a portfolio of, wow. of drawing and literally just knocked on doors. And I, I could speak a little bit of Swedish because I'd actually bought a book called <laughs> Swedish in Three Months, <laughs> which, which, which wasn't true. <laughs> But, but I, I, you know, I learned, I learned a little bit and I, my sister spoke Swedish because she lived here and her children, of course, who went to school here. So I, I picked up a bit, but mostly I spoke English and which kind of gave me an advantage because they were having to speak a foreign language and I could speak my own sort of thing. But mm -hmm. I literally sort of knocked on doors and just said, here's my portfolio. Do you need me? And I, my first job was at H&M. Um, which I think you probably have there. Um, I the H &M. amazing the clothes. Yeah, H H &M. yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. okay, yeah. That, that was, it was amazing. So uh, we we went up there. My sister was actually with me. It was before uh, she she then moved. I'd, I'd been here about three months, and then they were moved to Greece. So I was like stuck here myself. <laughs> thing, but anyway, but we went up to H and M, and amazingly enough, um, they had a really a really great uh, illustrator called Max Gustafsson, who became quite famous and. And they said, this is this is quite good timing that you come today because he is just moving to New York. And so we actually need somebody to replace him. So if you can draw like him, then you can have the job. Oh. So they gave me a pile of clothes and it was mostly menswear. And they said, right, come back in a week. So I took the pile of clothes home to my sister and she lived. Oh, um, I, I don't know in miles, but uh, in kilometers, it's about 200 kilometers. So what's that? 150 miles or something from, you know, from between Stockholm and where we live in North Shopping. And so I came home and just drew and drew and drew and drew, looking at his old ads and everything, then went back there and they said, yeah, you've got the job. So I worked there freelance for about three three months. And then, as I say, my sister was, was moving and I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, I probably, you know, I need a work permit or something. So I talked to them and said, you know, can you help me with a work permit? Can you give me a letter so I can apply? And they said, no, we don't do that kind of thing. You know, mm. sorry, uh, no. So I said, okay, then, well, bye. <laughs> so uh, I actually went back to England for about four months and lived with my 
with my poor parents because, you know, I'd been at college for three years and I'd been in Sweden for a while. And to come back, I was little, little Jackie again, you know, and I was like, no, I'm not little Jackie, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, um, another amazing thing, after about four months, I was thinking, what should I do? I, I don't want to live in England. I want to go back to Sweden. Mm -hmm. And suddenly one morning, uh, two letters arrived at breakfast and my father said, oh, the two letters from Sweden for you. And I opened them up and both of them were job offers. And uh, they said, you know, I, we don't know where you are now, but if you're back in Sweden, we've got a job for you. So I packed my bags again and went back there and uh, got those jobs, got letters from them and, and also got a few more letters from different people working freelance and then had to come back to London again, go to the Swedish embassy, apply. And they said, oh, and this was 79. And they said, uh, uh, no, sorry, it was 1980. Uh, and they said, uh, oh, you know, uh, this could take nine months. So, you know, don't, don't sort of hold your breath. And within two weeks, I got a letter saying, you've got a permit. Wow. So it was, it, was, it was meant to be. It yeah, was meant to be. Sounds like it. Wow. So, uh, so I came back here in June 1980, and I, and I haven't left since then. So... Uh, <laughs> Amazing. So, so these, so the fact that these were freelance opportunities, is that what gave you the push to kind of start your own business and just work freelance rather than working for one of the companies? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And in a way it was, it's funny because, um, I haven't been, I haven't been uh, fully in full-time employed until this past year. Wow. And actually I'm 65 in May. So, you know, that's sort of retirement here. So Right. I'm not going to retire, you know, I mean, artists <laughs> don't retire, but, but, but anyway, right. so I, I, it kind of set the pace for, I've been freelance my entire career. Wow. Um, it has its ups and downs because, you know, freelance, the good thing is that, you know, you can get jobs from anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the negative thing is that, you know, you have sort of, you have a salary this month, but maybe not for the next two. Exactly. Uh, so, but, but I love the freedom, um, mm -hmm. really, of being freelance. So, yes, yeah, so I decided I'll start my own firm immediately. Mm -hmm. um, I hired an office. And in fact, in the office beside me was a man who was an accountant and he helped me set up the business. So that was really good. And I, and I did a portrait of his children to pay him. Oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> Barter system. Yeah, you know, exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. That, that nine year old business mind was just coming right back into. <laughs> Uh, you know, getting you set. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your art. How would you um, describe your aesthetic or your style? And is it different now than it was when you first started and you first started creating? Um, yes. In a way, I think the different materials that I started to use over the years has changed my style a bit. But um, at the beginning, I worked a lot in in like pro markers, you know, and Copic markers, that kind of thing, uh, because it was fashion drawing. Um, but over the years, I've sort of I've added, you know, other other things like sort of, uh, well, acrylics, for example, and that sort of stuff. But I would say if you have to describe my my style, it's kind of decorative because I've always loved textile prints. Mm -hmm. So what I really uh, like doing even in my drawings is is having a lot of pattern one of my favorite artists um sort of way back at art school was Gustav Klimt because he had a decorative face mm -hmm. but everything else was pattern right. uh, that kind of thing so um I would say that yeah decorative is definitely um and and yes my, I, I would say yes my style has changed a bit um, but mostly with the sort of uh, the, with the arrival of mixed media, um, because I suppose there's always been some kind of mixed media, but it wasn't trendy until right. probably, you know, probably 15 years ago or something. It started to come in a way with scrapbooking when scrapbooking came. Right. Yeah. Uh, it was it almost like developed into mixed media. So um, that I've, that's really my style now, which I, I love. So even if I. If I do a portrait for something like a somebody uh, like a commission, um, I always glue lots of stuff on the background first, um, so I get texture or I get a bit of you know a pattern coming through that kind of thing, which I can then fill in. So yeah, do you do a lot of commission work? Is that is that a bulk of what you do or? Um, I suppose in a way, uh, yes. Uh, up and, as I say, I'll just explain that the past year I I've worked uh, freelance on a consultant basis as a teacher for 
probably 38 years, but not never full time ever, you know, the odd evening class or maybe a Friday morning or something like that. Um, and I've always had sort of commissions on the side coming in. Okay. And I mean, a commission can even be, you know, a magazine that says we need something and, uh, and that kind of thing. So, yes, I, I, I suppose the freelance work is commissions. It's, it's not me painting something that I like and then getting somebody to buy it. It's more right. somebody could you do a few ideas and then, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Okay. Well, how is your, how, how would you say your personality is reflected in your art? I mean, you obviously love color, you love the pattern and that comes through. How does that play in with your personality in, in your okay. art? Okay. Yeah. Um, my personality, it's, it's funny because when I was little, I was very shy um until I was about probably about 14 and a girl came to my class and we became best friends and she was wild and she'd be like expelled from her previous school um for throwing a, a hairbrush at someone who ducked it flew out of the window and hit a teacher uh, and so she you know you couldn't do that in English schools it wasn't it wasn't allowed sort of thing so but she for me she was extrovert and I think I was a closet extrovert really but just hadn't you know hadn't come out mm -hmm. so I became much more I don't know yeah extrovert so um I'm in a way I still have a bit of shyness um I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to perform in a play but if I'm in front of people I perform so I um I think that that comes out in in, in everything in my makeup I like bright red lipstick you know in, in my clothes I want pattern on my clothes huh? I, I wore this on purpose I thought you know we, we'll have to I'll have to show you how I am this is how I am um <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. in a way my um you know I don't do gray paintings it, it was very interesting because um Swedish watercolors are they have their favorite colors are sort of Payne's gray raw umber um neutral tint you know it's kind of the grayness of Swedish winter kind of thing and I I actually went to a, a watercolor class just for fun about probably about 15 years ago and uh it was really fun I really enjoyed it um but everyone was painting in those colors and you know it, it wasn't me. And um, I said, oh, I, I won't be here next week. I have to go to England. I'm going to go and stay with my sister. So they said, oh, what a shame. We have a man coming who, who's quite famous and he's going to have a class. You'll miss that, but we'll tell you about it. So I went off to England and I found, I don't know if you've ever heard of, there's an artist called Shirley Trevenna. Hmm. And she's a, a British uh, watercolorist. She's probably quite famous, actually. She's done lots of books. She's done some DVDs as well. But anyway, I found her book and she used, you know, quinacridone magenta and, you know, um, quinacridone gold and you know, all these. Kind. And so I, I was like, wow, this is the stuff. So I bought loads of paints and came back. So I came back to the class and they said, oh, it's such a shame that you missed this man. Look, this is some of the stuff that he did. And they showed me and it was like, you know, neutral tint, paints gray and raw umber. And I said, oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. This is what this is what I've discovered. And I showed the book and I showed the colors. And I said, I'm going to be painting in this. And they went, oh, wow. You know, so I was completely different. So I think that sort of showed that I wasn't in the same mold, you know. So anyway, their stuff was beautiful. I don't mean that. but. It didn't yeah. do it for me, you know, so. Right. And then when you found it and you discovered it, it was like, oh my, that's exactly, that's the thing. That's yeah. I exactly. remember um, when I first started dabbling in mixed media, I pretty much used the browns and the black and the, just the really very neutral and it felt safe, I think, but I really just felt like, well, I, I don't really know much about color. I'm not really sure. It kind of scared me. And then I took a class at an art retreat and it was like, everything was bursting with color. And I remember my, my friend that had come with me to help me teach at that retreat. She came back in the room in the hotel and I literally, there was stuff everywhere all over. And it was all in these bright colors. And she was like, okay, what happened? You know? And I was like, I don't know. There's just something just opened up. And I think it was, I can do this. And I love that. And I want as much yeah. I can, you know, as I can, as I can get. So um, exactly. I love that when you kind of make that, that real is that when you, you come to that point and you go, yeah, that's awesome. But I really like this. And you, then exactly. you gravitate and obviously that just kind of kept you like 
brought you exactly to where you are now. It's like, yeah, I yes. like that. that's nice, but this is more me, you know, in that person. Absolutely. So, yes. I, I, it makes you happy. Yeah. It makes you happy. Exactly. Yeah. So, so since we're talking about that, let's talk about your creative process because you have a very interesting approach to the research that brings you to the point where you are creating. And I really like to hear a little bit more about that. And I know our viewers and our listeners would be very interested about that. So tell us about that process. Okay. So this is really something that they taught us at at art school. So um, at at St. Martin's Um, for a design project, they always said, do research first and get as much research as you can. And then pick out the bits that speak to you. And uh, which was which was really clever, in fact. Uh, I remember one of the projects that they gave us was, for example, they said, right, you're gonna do um, some, you're gonna do a, a collection of clothes, but you're going to do textile prints as well. And it has to be camouflage, camouflage prints, but not camouflage, like, you know, like you think ar- army fatigues, a camouflage print against a chosen background. So you can choose whichever background you like, And then, you know, and then and then do some kind of camouflage against that background. And I mean, I had friends who were wild. I had one friend who who chose, um, you know, a a slaughterhouse (laughs) with, you know, um, you know, cows hanging up and down. And that was those were her prints. You know, they look like sort of sides of bacon and that kind of thing on her print. You know, I actually chose the Scottish Highlands, but I chose mosaic. So it was, you know, mosaics in all the kind of the heather colors and, you know, and this kind of thing. So it was it was very clever because we literally had to go in and 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 use the research um, to look at the colors, what colors go together, you know, all sorts of things. So that's something that I've taken with me into my art as well. And, and even when I teach, uh, I do the same thing, because the thing that I have realized with this research thing is that. You know, you can sort of you can sort of sit in your studio and you can go, "Mm, oh, that's maybe an idea. And so you think, yeah, I'll do that. So you get your stuff out and you start and you do one one painting or one one picture or something. Mm -hmm. And then you think, "Mm, yeah, that was good. Okay. Um, you don't think, how can I develop it? Or maybe you do. But you're going from one idea that's in your head. Whereas if you do research on something, if you have sort of a subject, um, I mean, I, I teach textile design now. So, so it's, you know, we're, we're looking at like the 1800s, we're looking at the 1700s. Mm-hmm. And so I will look at, you know, maybe films uh, from that time, you know, costumes, you know, you can go to Hollywood, uh, you look at actually books, you maybe look at the furniture, mm-hmm. you look at the, you know, the colors that were around at that time, you look at all sorts of things, and then you gather all of them together. I mean, Pinterest is fantastic, because, mm-hmm. you know, you can save all these pictures, and you can have this board, uh, and then you can look at things. But I still love books, I still love going to libraries and that kind of thing. Or just, you know, drawing, um, you know, going somewhere where you have have maybe 1700s architecture and you sit and you actually draw you look at the the patterns that are on a chair and you think oh that would be good that would be a stamp or that would be a stencil you know that Mm -hmm. kind of thing so in a way um I like to I did I had actually um uh, an exhibition um in Stockholm it's probably 2016 now but uh we were three people and one was a a, was um a potter so they did some ceramics another was a more watercolor and I did uh, acrylics and uh they said this is in the middle of Stockholm in the old town it's it was a, a little um uh gallery there and they said a lot of tourists go by so I think very we're going to say that it's got to be Swedish it's got to be something very Swedish which will speak to tourists and I was thinking what do I love about Sweden folklore the folklore of Sweden because uh, in Sweden everyone uh, you know not everyone but a lot of people sew their own you know national costume and that kind of thing and all the different sort of counties have different national costumes in different colors and I was thinking oh that could be quite fun so I looked at that you know the, the Dala horses you've probably seen them these wooden horses they're orange and they're hand painted that kind of thing so I made my own stamps I made my own stencils and then I did lots and lots and lots of jelly prints and then I I, I, I tore them up and then I used them in the background you know in my in my paintings so that was my research mm. so it that you know you kind of when you've done research you've you don't come to a standstill. You, there's no end to it because you just dig deeper and deeper. So I think m- one of the things that I think about often is that, you know, if you just come up with one idea, oh, that's a good idea and you do it, 
that's it. Whereas if you have 20 ideas, you, you know, there's always something else that you can take from it sort of thing. That makes so, so much yeah. sense when I, when I, when I hear that, it's one thing that, that I really caught from that is the tradition. You talked about the tradition of Sweden and that all of that encompassed those traditions of their costumes and what they made and all of that just yes. kind of flowed in. So it sounds like you gain a lot of inspiration from the country that you live in. And I, do. Wow, yes. I mean, yeah, it sounds like it, but I hadn't really thought about that when you think, okay, do the research on, you know, whatever those topics are, whether it's a color or whether it's a, an architectural style or whether it's um, a country and then mm-hmm. digging, digging, digging and more and more research. It's almost like if you get bored, it's okay because there's more there and you can just go, okay, well, let me go that direction or that direction rather than just that one thing. And I never really thought about that. I mean, I didn't go to art school, so I, it was not a concept that I was ever taught, but I think that that really makes a lot of sense. And then you have this arsenal, if you will, of things that you can come back to later because you, it's almost like developing an idea portfolio where all yeah. that stuff is in there. And if you, you know, you want to come back to it later. So what a, what a, what an, a fabulous idea. Um, I think that is definitely worth exploring for those of us that don't do that. So, <laughs> so let's talk about your, um, we all run into obstacles or creative blocks and in the creative process. And how does that look for you? And what do you do? What is it? That, what advice could you give to others who experience that? So I think the key is, is understanding that we all do have those moments no matter who we are or how high of a level creative we are or how popular or famous or whatever, we all go Mm. through that. So share some advice and how you deal with that and what that looks like for you. Okay. Um, One thing that I've discovered, which I think is quite interesting by talking to other artists is that we've all got this thing. It doesn't matter how wonderful our studio is. Mine is not tidy. You you put (laughs) put something out on Instagram a few days ago and said, what does your studio look like? I thought, not telling everyone, nobody is going to look fine. Um, so, so it doesn't help if I have a tidy studio, it, you know, if, if you have this creative block, um, it's difficult um, to, it, nothing really helps, uh, you know, uh, I say nothing, there are things that help, that's what I'm going to tell you, but, but um, I think that everybody has this thing, especially if you have a commission, and you think, oh, I should start that today, and that I'll just empty the dishwasher, or I'll just do this, or I'll just do that, because we're almost in fear of it not going well. Uh, and that can that can be a block. Um, what I have discovered, I mean, I've, I've had a career now for like 41 years, we'll say, um, is that you have to you have to push through um, the the I, I would say that the the research thing is a very good idea because um, sometimes that can help. Um, you know, sometimes you, ch- you, you do something, you say, I hate it. <laughs> You know, do that. No, hate it. You know, I mean, I've thrown pens across the room, you know, like a baby because you're so frustrated because, you know, it's not working. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I have I have noticed is to push through. And and um, uh, when I was at art school, I think it was year two, um, I had I had like three months, which were everything I did was horrible. And there's such pressure because you have classmates who are doing amazing things. Maybe they're not, but it looks like they are compared to me, you know. And I I actually got to meet um, a very famous um, uh, fashion illustrator from the 50s and 60s. And uh, he was was quite old by then, but I I got to go meet him. And I told him a little bit about, you know, what was going on and stuff. And and he said, so how's it going for you? And I said, well, actually at the moment, you know, real low, a real low, like three months, you know, nothing I do is any good. So, you know, it's really kind of poor me kind of thing. And he said, you know, I'm just going to I'm just going to give you a little tip. Um, He said, when you graduate and you're out in the real world, then he said, uh, you you can't afford to be a prima donna. He said, you can't afford to say, you know, oh, dear, you know, really bad time. You know, it's not working. He said, because you've got a deadline at 10 o'clock the next morning. And he says, somebody's waiting for you to do that. And if you don't fulfill that, there are like 10 people in the queue behind you. So, you know, get over that now, which was not exactly what I wanted to hear at the time. But I have used it myself and told my students that when they've been in the same state um, many, many times. I'm a morning person, so I can actually wake up quite early and I'm, I'm bright and chirpy, but I can fall asleep at like, you know, 
eight thirty at night. So I, I'm not good at night. So I, what he said to me was, work through the night if you have to. You know, you just you just don't sleep that day, sort of thing. Uh, I, I can't do that. So what I do is I go to bed. If it's not working, I just I go to bed and I set my alarm for four o'clock, and then I know that I have to deliver this thing at ten. And I at, literally it's willpower. I just say this has to work. Um, also, I'm a Christian, so you know I put up a prayer as well, and that often helps a lot. Absolutely. Um, but <laughs> but but I, I'd say that push through, mm-hmm. push through, because there is a breaking point. There's like a it's you get to the stage where you say this is going to work, and 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 I kind of think you know paper is cheap really, and you can just you can just keep doing stuff. And, you know, don't chuck it, you know, you didn't just screw everything up in fury. You could maybe, you know, rip it to bits. Or I have a pile of all my jelly prints. I have a pile of half finished stuff that I put there. Sometimes you could just tear that up and use it in something else. So, right. you know, just, just push through. And um, sometimes you need a break. And sometimes I just go and have a cup of coffee or something. Sometimes I say to myself, OK, I'll go to the library and then I'll come back. And, or, you know, or I'll just, I'm going to watch a Jane Austen and that will do, that will kind of hmm, calm me down and then I'll do it. You know, just uh-huh. something like that. Sometimes you need a break. Sometimes you, you have to test it. We're all different personalities. So I would say it's, it's up to the person themselves really. You know? Right. But that was. And then that reflection on, you know, why you said something about going and doing the dishes. It's like, if I find myself procrastinating or, you know, I find other things, well, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to do the laundry. I'm going to do this. And it's like, okay, what's the real reason here? Like, you know, and oftentimes it's just that fear of if I go in there, what if I can't do what I really want to do? Like, what if I can't, you know, and it's like, but you're not going to know if you don't go in there and just do something. And it's true at times it's just kind of snowballs and it's like, and then if it's still not gelling and working, well, then go take a break. And I'm with you, Pride and Prejudice. Absolutely. A hundred times. Because I know you had said um, that I had read that you are, you like to watch the classic movies kind of as your sort of second to creating and that you could, you know, verbalize the scripts. I totally get that. There's Pride and Prejudice is mine where it's like, I can listen to it while I'm creating and I can just speak what they're going to say without even watching it. It's like, Absolutely. like, and I'll bet that's what you're doing too. It's just like, you, you've listened to it so many times and my husband just laughs. He's like, okay, <laughs> I have a few movies like that too, but yeah. I love that. I love that. So <laughs> let's talk about the tech side of things because you started your career really mm-hmm. kind of before, or right around the time the personal computer started coming. Cause I was in college when the Mac came out in 85, 84. And yes. you started even before then, even in college, you didn't have, there was no computers, there was no Instagram, Facebook, or any of that. And that has really changed the landscape over the years. And you've seen it all. So yeah. yeah. So how has that affected your business and your work and your creative journey? Exactly. Um in a way, I can give an example with sort of with uh, textile prints, because the first textile prints that I did, I had to do the repeat. <laughs> so, you know, you would you would draw something uh, do so, and show people and they would say, yeah, love that. Yeah. Right. We want it in a repeat. OK, so you have to like divide it up into four, take, you know, do that, do that kind of thing so that it, you can just repeat it in any direction. You have to do that manually. And uh, I learned that at, at college and then they make screens for each color and that kind of thing. Well, nowadays, you know, there's none of that. Everything's done on Illustrator. And in fact, um, I've worked for a company, um, North Shopping, where I live, is an old textile town. So there were quite a lot of, of businesses that started here. And uh, there was a sportswear company and, and I'd done a lot of um, a lot of prints for them for, you know, everything from sort of, you know, training clothes for you know, gym clothes and uh, even bikinis, swimsuits, that kind of thing. And literally, I, you know, it would be like oil, oil pastel and watercolor. I would do this and they'd say, yeah, great, we'll do it. And and I could just hand it to them. Um, as a repeat but nowadays you have to know illustrator and I haven't taken the time to do that I mean I've done a bit dabbled but not enough so that uh, I can use it so um, nowadays you know I 
because I, I don't know Illustrator and I only really know Photoshop very, very, you know, um, it scared the pants off me because um, I, I'm thinking, you know, I've got to go, I've got to go and study again. I, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not interested, you know, this kind of thing. Um, but then it, then it came to the business with, with a website. Mm -hmm. And I had this friend who um, is actually deaf so when I, I had to contact him, he was he was fantastic. I went over to his house and um, he and we could talk like this. But otherwise, I had to text him and send him photos and this kind of thing. And he did my website for me. Um, and it was great back then. But I mean, it was like 2009 or something when he did it. Uh, and I still had this and it was still the old pictures. And if I needed to put new pictures up, I had to send them to him. And mm. it got so complicated. And I just thought, oh, it'd be so much better if I could do my own. But, you know, in the early days, there was sort of, there was WordPress or there was whatever, you know, and it probably still is WordPress, but but it was kind of like I was thinking, it's not, up, I don't, I want something that's up to date. I want something that looks fresh. Um, and, and I want to be able to do it myself because I want to be able to sort of say in my pajamas, oh, yeah. I think I'll just do this and go and do it, you know, rather than having to plan it beforehand so I was actually quite scared of everything technical even making films I started I started my YouTube channel probably about I can't remember now but probably about seven eight years ago or something and I got my daughter to help me to edit films and she was like oh for goodness sake mommy I'll do it for you you know <laughs> and, and so she did it for me and I sort of said hang on hang on let me write notes while you're doing it and she said no, no no I haven't got that kind of time and I was thinking I'll never learn this so um to to, to get into NTU, I just want to say that you were a lifesaver. I actually didn't think it was possible. I yeah. honestly didn't think it was possible. I thought I was too old. I thought I was too like stuck in my ways. I was too, um, too an what do you say, analog, analog or analogical or whatever. I wasn't digital at all. Um, and I just thought I'll never learn. So you really, you really, really helped me. So thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. That's what Makers Tech U is about is, is, as, you know, I've got the range of members, you know, someone like you who started out with everything hands on, then happened to be thrown into this, you have to learn these things, you know, yeah. having that website gives you the opportunity to have your work out there as your home base where you can get commissions and you can get work and offer courses and all of those things. And mm -hmm. I, I know it was, it's been a pleasure working with you and seeing and knowing that your confidence has increased to, I can do that. If I want to make this change, I can make this change and I can do it on my own without feeling like it's never going to get done because then I have to go through someone else to make that happen. Yes. And I love that because that's part of what I want to do is equip the members to where they feel like I can do this myself. And like Absolutely. you said, you didn't think you could, but you no. have, and you still do. And so yes. yeah, you're yeah. doing online courses as well. And I think that um, when asked about your goals for the next, say, six months to a year, that's something that you're wanting to do is to really amp up your online teaching. It is really. Um, the thing is, this whole, you know, COVID thing has affected us too. Yeah. Sweden has been sort of a, a flagship for the world because we didn't lock down. Right. And then now suddenly uh, there are restrictions, obviously. But but um, some people, I mean, I've had I've had sort of um, art classes with people who are who are pensioners and they're a bit more wary about sitting in a room together. Mm. Um, so. I've realized that, um, you know, this this thing d during the time I was actually working at the school where I'm working now, this textile design thing um, a year ago. Uh, well, more than that. It was like March, March, April last year. And we had to have lockdown um, mm -hmm. just for schools. Um, and so I, ha I started filming. In fact, it was at that time that I did my website with you. So it was quite good because, you know, I had a bit more time at home. Um, right. But I was, having to, I was having to film myself doing things and then teach them that way. And I realized it was it was doing that uh, and then giving written instructions kind of thing. And then the odd Zoom meeting. I realized this is kind of possible and I can reach more people that way. Right um so so anyway so uh, I, yes I would like to do more online things um I, I think you'll remember that uh I did it on Squarespace and it was a it was a monster as you called it <laughs> I had far too many films uh but it was my first and so it was you know so but but I would actually like to try teachable as well because what I I'll tell you what I really love about Makers Take You is um 
I'm a very visual learner. Um, lots of people can just like read instructions and they understand immediately. I have to see it, mm -hmm. pause it, go do the thing, go back two more seconds. Yes, she said that I'll do it. That was how I did it. Right. And that was so fantastic because I don't know if I've got a short, you know, concentration span or I don't know what it is, but to have it on video, knowing I can go back, watch the entire video again, but also pause it and do the thing that I'm supposed to do and then go back was amazing. One of the things I must say that I loved about uh, your your teaching on how to do the website was that you started with Pinterest and you said, I want you to make a Pinterest board. You made arty from the beginning mm -hmm. because I get so bored with stuff that isn't yeah. arty. <laughs> and yeah. so you made it you made it very exciting by yeah. saying, right, you want to look for the right, you know, um, what's it called, fonts, and you want to look for this, and what kind of button do you want, what's your colour, you know, uh, you did it so well, uh, it was really, I, I showed my, my, my girls came, and I said, oh, you've got to see this, you've got to see this, it's just amazing, look, 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 this is what I've done, and they said, oh, those are really your colours, you know, and it was wonderful, awesome. so thank you. Uh, no, I appreciate that, I appreciate the feedback, yeah, it's, it's really hard to make technology fun. And I mean, I love it because to me, it's very creative, but not to the, you know, most people, most creatives and artists are like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't care. But to yeah. be able to say, all right, we can make this because it is a reflection of you. It's a reflection of your art and your creativity and your personality. It can be fun and colorful and beautiful and try yes. to put that in there a little bit at the beginning as you know, as you go through. So I appreciate yeah. it. So, well, I can see your enthusiasm with regard to Makers Tech. If you were to give anyone advice, someone in your shoes, someone who is maybe just starting out, what would you say to them if they're sort of on the fence and they're like, I really don't know if I can do it. I, I know I need this, but you know, what, what should I do? What advice would you give them? Um, well, I would say, I mean, I, you know, as I say, I'm 64 uh, and, and if I can do it, then anybody can. Um, for me, it was almost an extension of my creativity um, because having to ask somebody else to do something, you always lose something in translation. Do you know what I mean? Point. Whereas this was literally, I could test that, test that color, test that color, test that, which, you know, uh, if you're paying somebody else to do it, I mean, apart from anything else, it cost a fortune for me to sort of say, mm, no, maybe can you just tweak that slightly? You know, this kind of thing. I can do it myself. It, as I say, in my pajamas, if I wanted to, but it was literally, it was a, it was an extension of my creativity. So if you, uh, it's not a waste of time. It's the most wonderful thing. Uh, right. Do it. And, and, and what I must say is, I mean, I don't know how many time I con times I contacted you, uh, but it felt so safe knowing that I could just, you know, click the support button or, or write a question under somebody else's question. And sometimes somebody else had asked the question that I was going to ask and I got an answer. So um, it, it, it was a real community, uh, but I felt very, very close to you. I mean, it was just like you were, you know, uh, here in here in Sweden, it was it was amazing. You you were so close. Also, it was quite good that I knew um, that uh, you know uh, it could be late at night for me, but it was early morning for you, so I could like contact you. I knew you were awake, you know, and that kind of thing. That's definitely so, and, and you're so fast at replying; it's marvelous. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, that's important to me is is that the members know that I am there to help as much as I want to equip you to do it and be able to do it on your own. I'm always there and available when you need a question answered or you need help. So yes, which is very much what I love about this. It's interesting though, to see the progression of lots and lots and lots of questions. And then little by little, I don't hear anything. And it's, I know <laughs> why it's like, Oh, there, it's like sort of that the bird is ready to fly. And then it goes yeah. on, on its own. And then when you need some extra help, I'm here when you need me. So, well, I appreciate yeah. the feedback very much. And um, it has been a pleasure working with you. And I always pop into websites that have been created and just kind of see what the members are doing and, you know, how their, um, you know, progression has updated and changed. So it's, 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 it's kind of like watching your kids, succeed you know it's like yeah. oh I love this I love this so well I really appreciate your time Jackie and you sharing very much all of these words of wisdom and tips for us because there's definitely some new things that I had not heard 
um, of ways to approach creating and doing things. So I really do appreciate it. Is there anything special that you have upcoming? Um, any, anything, I know you said you had, you're going to be working on some courses. Is there anything that you want to share with our listeners and our viewers um, of anything that you've got coming up? Um, uh, not, uh, not, not at this very moment, mostly okay. because uh, I'm, I'm working full time at this school, okay. at least until May. But yeah. but um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, I've got I've got many people who have said, oh, can't you do a course on that? Like fashion drawing or can't you do a, for, a, a, a one on portraits or something? Right. So that's the kind of thing that I, I think will be next because I haven't done that yet. So. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so that, that's probably what's in the pipeline. Nice. So, well, yeah. we'll have your um, all your social links and everything in the post um, for anyone who is wanting to check out Jackie's work. It's very colorful and very, um, it looks, it reminds me of fabric. It reminds me of, you know, quilts and other things. So it's really yeah. beautiful and you definitely need to um, you. check it out. So again, thank you so much, Jackie, for being here. I really appreciate thank it. You. And um, thanks everybody for joining us and for listening and watching mm -hmm. online. So until next time, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Are you ready to turn overwhelm into something manageable? Listen, I know you have a dream for your creative business, but you know it takes learning technology to make that happen. So stop wasting piecing it all together with YouTube videos that end up confusing you even more. Let me help you make learning and mastering the tech easy and fun so you can spend more time focused on your art passion. Take a look at Makers Tech U. Investing in yourself is the best investment you'll ever make. So check it out at makerstechu.com forward slash join. I look forward to seeing you there.